Marconi and Tesla, and uh, we haven't found anything. But I think it's, we're just starting off. We're just looking for very simple kinds of signals at easy places to look. And I think it would be easy to miss them. There are a number of groups doing this uh, in Japan and Australia, Argentina. Of course, the best group is here at Berkeley. Um, we have a number of different searches in radio and visible and infrared, looking for a rich variety of signals. How, um, how am I doing on time? Where's my moderator? One minute. OK. Um, we have uh, about 20 people working on SETI here, sponsored by the National Science Foundation and NASA, and some uh, individuals, some in this room. And we have help from corporations. And we use this big telescope that Paul talked about, the Arecibo telescope. Um, and uh, it's 1,000 feet across. It holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. Uh, we store our data. And we send it out to these people who, who uh, run the SETI at Home screensaver. Everybody gets a different part of the sky to analyze. Um, and there are a lot of people helping us, millions of people helping us. And now there are people using our software to work on all kinds of other projects, not just SETI, but doing climate prediction, global warming, looking at HIV drugs, malaria drugs, cancer drugs, gravity waves. There's a lot of different things you can run on your home computer. You can do all kinds of science projects on your home computer. Um, we're doing optical SETI experiments, looking for laser signals. Jeff has done a really nice optical experiment at Lick Observatory down near San Jose on, and at the Keck Telescope in Hawaii. But this is a summary of our data. 30 trillion fruitless tries. Now we're up to actually a million fruit. We haven't found ET. But I think it's not surprising. We're just learning how to do this. Um, if you look at all the searches that have been done, it's very little compared to what you need to kind of systematically cover the sky. And if ET is sending a, a signal out here at 10 gigahertz, we would easily miss them. And so I'm optimistic in the long run. The capabilities are growing exponentially. And we're building new telescopes. And there's a big international project to build a new square kilometer array. And maybe eventually we'll be able to use the sun as a gravitational lens, and, uh, and which would be a huge telescope. Let us read license plates on extrasolar planets. But here's a kind of summary is we haven't found ET. We're still working on it. But we have a long ways to go. And so um, um, absence of, of evidence is not evidence of absence. And, and I think just because we've been doing SETI for a while and we haven't found them doesn't mean that they're not out there. And so um, I have more slides on the Fermi paradox, and we'll get to that later. Thank you. OK, Jeff Marcy. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks, Paul and Dan. Is my microphone working correctly? Good. Uh, thanks. A great, great talk, Dan. Thanks for all the nice words. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're funnier than I am, and, and you're the guy doing the real work of searching for extraterrestrials. So while I'm going to provide you with, I think, a strong argument that Dan's never going to succeed, uh, if it wasn't for people like Dan doing that kind of work, we will never, ever know the answer. So you've got to actually do the work that, that Dan is doing. So I'd like to address um, all of you tonight. I know there's faculty and, and staff and students here, and um, it, this is a wonderful occasion. I'd like to offer you uh, a perspective that's very rarely articulated. The question of intelligent life uh, really must be framed uh, intelligently. Uh, our universe contains hundreds of billions of galaxies, and each of those galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars. And so those 10 to the 22 suns simply constitute too many throws of the biological dice uh, for technological life to be absent in the universe. So we really have no debate at all when considering the prospects for technological life in the universe as a whole, uh, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. The, the number of suns is just too large. But thinking of the galaxy as a whole, and now looking closer at home, uh, the nearest galaxy, Andromeda, is over a million light years away, making both dialogue with any advanced species there uh, and transportation to Andromeda best left up to uh, to those that have warp drive. Um, the, the question of 
technological life in the Milky Way galaxy alone remains an open one, in my view, because 200 billion stars is a number, 200 billion, that's reminiscent of the state lottery. Uh, sometimes there's only one, or at most a few, winners, uh, despite the large number of lottery players. Uh, winners are few and far between. And so it may be with technological life. Uh, the real question, in, if you really want to think carefully, the real question is how far away is the nearest technological civilization? Is the nearest technological civilization a few light years away, hundreds of light years away, thousands of light years away, locating them halfway across the Milky Way galaxy? That's the real question. And if you think then about the Drake equation, if just one of those many parameters that you saw has a very low probability, one in a million or one in 10 million, then it doesn't matter what the values of the other parameters are. That one value that's low will wipe out all the others. For example, if the Earth's global environment uh, remained delicately, well, our own Earth's environment remain delicately stable for 4 billion years, 4.5 billion years. Against impacts by uh, asteroids, uh, the runaway greenhouse effect, uh, freezing of the plate tectonics that regulates the carbon dioxide circulation uh, on the Earth, and, and more such nemeses, the Earth has dodged multiple bullets for 4 billion years, any one of which would have meant game over. Uh, for advanced life. Uh, Mars and Venus show you what happens when game is over. Is such environmental stability for four billion years a one in a thousand uh, long shot, or is it one in a million or worse? As another example, one may ask the following question. Does Darwinian evolution normally yield creatures with big brains, uh, vocal cords, uh, a, a, an amazing uh, Chopin-like dexterity. Uh, uh, after four billion years, uh, this, we, we didn't have any Homo sapiens on this planet until a blink of an eye ago. Four billion years passed before finally Homo sapiens sprang up. And so the question arises, does it normally take four billion years to get a uh, technological species, or could it be typically twice as long or three times as long to get uh, a smart critter? Uh, why four billion years? So perhaps we Homo sapiens are sort of the Darwinian early birds uh, waiting for other technological eggs to hatch in the galaxy. Just those two terms alone in the Drake equation, representing the stability of the environment for four billion years and the early or possible early arrival of hominids, could diminish the predicted number of technological civilizations uh, to under a few, maybe a dozen at most, or even less. And we haven't even considered yet in the Drake equation the, the L word. But the Drake equation is really just theory, with parameters that could go either way. Most people simply adopt the psychologically comforting notion that we are not alone. After all, who wants to be alone? So the popular model of our galaxy, and it is a model of our galaxy, scripted in the textbooks of science fiction, it has it that our galaxy contains stars, it contains planets in a, a disk, a flattened disk in a bulge, but our galaxy also contains numerous advanced technological civilizations scattered throughout the disk and the bulge of our galaxy. Picture the stars and the planets and all those advanced civilizations that are part of the model. In this popular model, the galaxy is bursting at the spiral arms with superluminal space-faring vessels, a la the depictions in Star Trek and Star Wars and, and Avatar and Battlestar Galactica. The, the galaxy is lousy with aliens. Uh, this model of our galaxy is perfectly okay theoretically. Uh, but the Drake equation doesn't, and the Drake equation certainly doesn't rule out uh, advanced civilizations in large numbers. But I think we should be wary of drinking the science fiction Kool-Aid. Uh, we have another diagnostic about the denizens in our galaxy, and that's data. 